reading from the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all, according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be, Thanks to, God. be to God. A reading from the first letter of St. Peter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope <clears throat> through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by the power of God are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now, for a little while, you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger into the nail marks, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now, a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst, and said to them, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, 
and bring your hand and put it into my side. And do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that through this belief you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I've probably given you the impression in the last 20 months that that rowing was always a a really great experience and that it was invigorating and enlivening and all of those things, and in fact it was. And some of the meatheads from my boats have been through here over the last couple of years, and you've gotten to see them, and they're getting better all the time, those guys. Yep, yep, they are. And it was generally just a superb experience. And then, of course, when it all ended in smoke and ash, Uh, Not too many people know this, but Buffalo, New York is really one of the best rowing towns in the country. Not many people would know that because there's this thing called the Black Rock Canal which runs along the Niagara River. And if you go too far down toward Niagara Falls, you get in a little bit of trouble, but you generally stay away from the falls. Everything works out well. And it was there that we had that one really great season. I was in in the Jesuits at the time. I was teaching at uh, Canisius College up there belonged to the West Side Rowing Club, and our summer season was over the top great. Uh, it was that year that we won the Canadian, not the Canadian Henley, which is a super big deal, but the Canadian Nationals, which is a pretty big deal for the Masters. In the fours and the eights, go us, and then Tuesday, after the Sunday of our triumph, is I was just doing a little piddly row along the canal and ruptured a disc in my back, and that was the end of all of it, right? Really a terrible experience. And I was in the hospital for a while and had limped around with it for 20 years and then finally marched up to 71st Street and got my back fixed 20 years later. But in the interim there, it's really hard to say goodbye to a sport you love so much, as some of you know. And so after Buffalo, I got shipped off to Cambridge for studies. And if you're a, if, if you're a sidelined rower, there's pretty much no worse town in the galaxy to be than Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? Every time you go out to go to class or take a walk or go this way or that way, there's a boat going by. And it brings out the envy and the pettiness and all that other kind of stuff. But I was really glad to know I wasn't the only one. Once when riding my really junky old bike, which no one would steal, from class over to the pool on the other side of the river, I ran into a friend at the top of the bridge, a guy who's now teaching out in Milwaukee, and we got into a big conversation. And then Two other people came along and stopped right at the top of the bridge near where we were. And it looked like to be a a mother-daughter combination. And the mother was saying how beautiful it was to see the boats rowing under the bridge. And in a lull in our conversation, I heard the daughter say, and she had her arm in a cast. She said, oh, yeah, it's really lovely, Mom. Actually, what I'd like to do is take that guy's bicycle and drop it on all those rowers. And the mother said, that's a horrible thing. And I I held my tongue. I didn't say a word. But what I really wanted to tell you is, amen, sister. I feel the same way every day. (laughs) There's nothing worse than watching it happen, being an observer, when you want to participate, right? And you've experienced that in 101 different places. When you want to be participating and you're, for whatever reason, feeling like an observer. And that desire to participate is truly one of the great gifts that God gives us, that desire to participate in the life of God and participate in the life of the church and participate in the life of a priest and a prophet and a king. And not just to watch it and not to watch other people doing it, but to be on the field, in the boat, not on the bridge, not on the bench. You want to be in it. And God's given us that desire. And it's the story of the first reading today in that it was a time in church history. This is only the second chapter of Acts of the Apostles. And in the second chapter of Acts of the Apostles, everything is going just great. Uh, five, May 14th, I think, is the Sunday when we'll hear things weren't going so well. But at this story in the life of the church, at this point in the life of the church, everybody is participating. 
Listen to what it said. They all joined in the learning. They learned what the apostles were teaching them. They all joined in the breaking of the bread. They all joined in the communal life. They all joined in selling their stuff and supporting the community. This was a community of participants. There wasn't an observer to be found. And as the reading says, they all shared in the awe, in the awe of the presence of the risen Christ. 100% participation. Nobody reduced to observer status. Later on, when some people felt like they were pushed into observer status, it got to be difficult for the church, but at this golden moment that we hear today, everybody's participating. St. Thomas, understandable experience. St. Thomas was off doing whatever he was doing when Jesus first came through the door and said to them, peace, peace, I send you. Now, just as these disciples and the chronological order is reversed, what happens in the gospel today happened before what happens in Acts of the Apostles. But in this experience of being in that room and having Jesus walk in, those 11 people participated fully in connection with Christ. Now, Thomas is out doing his thing, and he comes back, and they tell him the story. And now he's observing them. He's observing this terrific connection with Jesus Christ. He's going on other people's experience. And he says, that's not enough. I want to participate in this connection with the risen Christ. I want to put my finger in his side, and I want to touch the wounds in his hand. I want to see him. I want to touch him. I want to participate. Because sitting on the sidelines isn't doing it for me. I love you guys. I love your story. But I, I want to participate. And I'm not there with the way things have gone so far. And so when Jesus comes back, does he reprimand Thomas for wanting to participate? I don't think he does. He reaches out and says, go ahead, Thomas, do it. Now he draws a limit and says, you can't, sometimes we want to participate and we can't. Blessed are those who want this particular experience in which to participate, but they can't because of historical reasons. But Thomas, there's nothing wrong with you wanting to be fully in the game being one of the people who's had this experience of me. And when we find that time and time and time again in the Scripture, people who don't want to be on the sideline hearing about God, they want to be in relationship with God. Friends, the stories today, both of them, come back to the story of the centrality of the Eucharist when we look at the early church and when we look at the apostles. That's one of those experiences in which we all want to participate more fully. That we don't want to just watch people go to communion. And we don't want to just watch people participate, not just in the reception of the Eucharist per se, but in the larger participation in the life of the church. In that larger participation in relationship with the risen Christ. We don't want to be on the bridge. We want to be in the boat. We don't want to be on the bench. We want to be on the court or on the field, and God has given us that desire. And today it's not so much about noticing our own desires as it is about noticing the desires of people in our lives and to be in awe as the early disciples were. When we hear someone tell us, regardless of the language they use, that they want to participate more fully in relationship with Christ and in the life of the church, now, priests, prophets, and kings, the regular mass folk, this is part of the job description that gets a little bit hairy sometimes when we have to listen very carefully. What people are really saying is, I want to participate and I feel like an observer. Help me participate. Help me not feel like I'm the second team or I'm stuck on the bridge. How do people say that? Let me tell you one of the great ways people say that. I'm divorced and remarried. I can't go to communion. I feel like I'm really on the sidelines. And sometimes that, that, that morphs into a criticism of the church or a sense of unease with the church or a disapproval of the church. But come on, let's be the big kids. Let's listen to this thing deeply because what that says is I want to participate and because of the way things are, I can't. I feel like an observer. Let's go in the direction of other people who feel like for whatever reason they've been rendered 
members of the observer class? What about gay Catholics? What about di divorced and remarried? What about people who've made tough decisions, decisions that they might even regret? So many, many times when people sound critical of religion, when they sound critical of church, what they're really saying is underneath that, I feel like I'm an observer and I want to participate more fully in the peace that only Christ can give. I'm not asking you to evaluate whether this doctrine or that doctrine is right. I'm just asking you to listen. To listen to that plea for mercy, for inclusion, for connection. To listen to what the Holy Father says about every person being a field station of a hospital where people can come and say, this is what's going on. Can you just listen to me? And you guys do that so very, very well. And the point today is to affirm it. And it's not just people who've made choices that make them feel like observers. It's people who've experienced loss that make them feel like observer. How difficult it is to believe in God's love when someone you love very, very much has been taken out of your life in a way that you don't like, in a way that breaks your heart and makes you sad. In those moments, when people aren't really criticizing Holy Mother Church, when they're going right to God and saying, how can you believe in God when this is going on? Okay, I get it. You're in a tough spot, man. You've experienced some significant loss, and you don't feel like you are participating in the love of God. That's okay. People go through it. And so what about you? Who's that person out there who feels like, for whatever reason, they're standing on the bridge? They're sitting on the bench. They want to be on the field or in the boat, and for whatever reason, they're not there. And that sadness and that sense of loss easily is expressed as a sense of frustration or anger. And we're the big kids. We're the ones who need to listen deeply. We're the ones who need to say, okay, God really is calling you into that deeper relation. And I'm not asking you to think of specific answers. I'm just asking you to listen to Thomas's complaint as the complaint of a lot of people. His concern, his misgiving, his sadness is all around us. Thomas said, in other words, I'm glad for you guys, but I want to be there. Who in your life is feeling like an observer when it comes to participation in the life of the church? Feels like an observer when it comes to the story of God's love. Feels like an observer when it comes to the truth of the Eucharist. God has placed that desire in their hearts for deeper participation. It's a sacred and beautiful gift, and we've been asked to tend to it. <clears throat> to whom, maybe, is God asking you to speak the consoling word that will rouse the observer, give them hope of full participation, and give them confidence that God loves them right now? To whom is God asking you to speak that encouraging word to affirm their desire to participate more fully? So it's about listening to what other people are saying and recognizing that Thomas's experience is pretty widespread. He doesn't want to be an observer. He wants to be a participant. He wants to participate fully in the experience of Christ. Who doesn't? And sometimes people feel like, for whatever reason, for their own choices, because of God's actions, who knows what? They're on the bench. They're on the bridge. They're not playing. They're watching other people have this experience of Christ, and they don't like it. And that's a good thing. And God put that desire in them, like God puts it in you and in me. So how do we become even better stewards of it when people have something harsh to say about God or the church or something else? And underneath it is that desire to be more connected with Christ. Who may be in your orbit is really saying, I want to participate more. I want that peace in my heart. Help me find it. Help me connect with Christ. Let us pray.